So now we're going to talk about a hashed base implementation of our map. And this is the answer to the world's most common programming interview question. But we're going to do hash maps and then tree maps. Tree maps are harder. So hash maps turn out to be beautifully simple. And that's kind of the reason that um, everyone likes these as interview questions, because the interviewer can remember the answer. A tree map, they might have trouble remembering. And so <laughs> it's the perfect thing in an interview to say, draw me a hash map, because they know the, they still remember the answer from when they went to school. They'd have to do a little review to get the tree map right. So here we go. So let's talk a little bit about our hash map implementation. It's got a weird order. And once you see the data structure internally, it'll be clear why there's a weird order. It is like a Python 2 dictionary, and it's like a Java hash map. It's very similar to both of these things. I'm guessing the code we're going to write is very similar to when, when Guido made his first dictionary. It's going to have extremely fast insert and looked up. Just like Python 2 dictionaries and Java hash maps, it's going to be iterable, like Java's Python 2's dictionaries and Java's hash maps. And it builds on linked lists. Surprisingly, it's really easy to build a hash, lit, hash map if you understand linked lists. And so it's, it's covered in chapter 6.5.1 and 6.6 .6 in Kernighan and Ritchie. 6.5.2 is literally the hardest part of the book. And that's why we kind of start with 6.6 .6 and then kind of go back to 6.5. Okay, so let's take a look at our data structures and how we're going to go from the list map to the hash map. So our, our, our list map is pretty simple. We've got the entries in the map, which are key value, which we've decided are going to stay public. We've got the prev and the next for the map entry, which is just, you know, we're going to link these things together. And then the list map itself, it's got a head and it's got a tail and maybe a count and a few other things and then the methods, etc. because we've done encapsulation. So the hash map entry, if you look at it, it's pretty much identical. And that's because the entries in a hash map are just part of a linked list. The key to the hash map is there's multiple linked lists. And we see that in struct hash map. And underscore buckets is how many buckets we have. In a, in a more sophisticated hash map implementation, we would have the number of buckets grow as size grew and the, and the list got too long, but we're going to keep that. So that's called rehashing, and we're going to keep that out of our conversation. So, but we're going to have a number of buckets, and in this case, it's going to be eight. So those are called hash buckets. And then we're going to have heads, plural, we're going to have eight of them, and tails, eight of them. But within a particular head and a tail, it really is a hash map. So as you're writing the code for the hash map, go back to the list map. I mean, literally copy the list map code and then change the singular to plural. And you'll see some of the things I show you in the actual code. So if we look at how a list map looks, it's got a head and it's got a bunch of entries that have previs and next. I'm not even showing the previs and the arrows. I'm just showing the next, but assume there's always previs there because it's a way for us to link things in. But if you look at the hash map, so you take the actual key, you run it through a hash function, which creates some big number no matter how, but it is just a number. No matter how long the key is, it can be one character or 2,000 characters. Eventually, the hash runs a calculation that gives us back a number, it's sort of a pseudo-random number that has, you know, equally likely, and there's a whole science of hashing. And then we take a modulo, and in this case, we have four buckets. So we take this hash calculation, modulo 4, and that gives us a number from 0 through 3. And with that number, we pick the linked list, and then we add it to the linked list, just as if we were doing this with a linked list. So the moment once we've done the hash and we picked a bucket, it really is exactly the same as a linked list. So a hash map with four buckets is the same as four linked lists and you pick the linked list by the hash computation. And hash computation is deterministic and predictable, so wherever we put D, it's going to be in bucket one. And we can look it up in bucket one, we can store it in bucket one, etc. And so for inserting M equals 90, that's going to hash into, into bucket two, and we're going to put it in that, that linked list. Okay? So it is beautifully simple. Now what is a hash calculation? This is actually from my uh, Postgres for Everybody course. Basically, the hash maps large data items to a single 
a single number, basically, and these are called hash values. So the whole concept of a hash function, when used with a modulo, in this case I've got 16, modulo 16 in this picture, it maps a big string into some fixed number of buckets, and often the buckets are power of two, but they don't have to be. It's really a modulo operation. And so there's a whole um, there's a whole science of hashing and hash functions. And it turns out the hashing and hash functions are a big part of security and digital signatures and all that stuff. And so there is there are people who spend their whole lives researching how to build good hash functions. And so there's this this SHA-256 compression function, you can go look it up. You can see what's going on here is like the arrows are shifting and the plus with a circle is exclusive ORs and they sort of both show you um, the shifting and the exclusive OR and they give you a diagram of how these things and they shift an exclusive OR, yada, yada. And they're taking the pieces of a, a, a value, it's computed in a loop and updated and what they're showing you is what happens each iteration through the loop. And so um, the idea is, is we are going to take a string, a string array, and we're going to take a number of buckets. And the idea of a hash is it is just some integer number. And we're going to go through each of the items, each of the characters in the string. That's the four star stir, star plus, stir plus plus. And we're going to take the current value of hash. In this case, we're going to shift it three to the left, and then we're going to exclusive or it with the character we're looking at. So you can say shift three, exclusive or, shift three, exclusive or. So you can think of it as like an accumulation, but the exclusive or is a nice form of accumulation in that it, it increases the randomness, the pseudo randomness of this thing. And so exclusive or just turns out to be a super valuable calculation. And so this, this loop is going to run so many times. And so we're going to print it out. You're going to see the hex. If we're just taking the letters HI, you can see kind of the internal hash value growing and changing. And you can kind of see it going from uh, right to left as it sort of grows. Um, and there's new data being put in bitwise. It's a bit, you know, bit exclusive or. But at the very end, it says return hash percent buckets, which takes the modulo operator of the number of buckets. And in this case, I'm going to be using eight buckets just to run the hash function, right? Give me the bucket for this string. So you can see me running different things on the right-hand side and getting back the ultimate final bucket. So hi goes in bucket one, hello goes in bucket seven, and world goes into bucket four. This is, this is really inspired by, you know, the, the, the shifting and the masking, but I've simplified it so you can kind of see what's going on. And in our particular hash, it's, it's good enough for our purposes, but it's probably going to have collisions when treated against a whole series of random data. It's not going to be as good, and that's where a fancy uh, hash like uh, SHA-256 would be helpful. So, now that we understand the basic data structures and how hashing functions work, let's up next we're going to take a look at actually building a hash map, or at least adapting our list map and turning it into a hash map.